This is a summary of part two of David Hume's Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion. And it starts off with Demia, who's surprised because at the end of part one, Cleanthes has just indicated that he thinks he can describe God using human language, and he can also prove that God exists using reason and evidence. So Demia thinks that that's, uh, for one, not necessary because God's existence is already known to everybody, and also that God's nature can't be described in human language. At most, we can just say that God is spirit, and that means that God is not material, but his nature so far transcends our ability to understand that we're just uh, limited in terms of our ability to describe him. Philo chimes in and says he agrees with Demia and says that God's existence is, quote, unquestionable and self-evident, and that nothing exists without a cause. It's not clear that by, by saying this, that this would make Philo a theist, but he agrees with Demia, and so we'll just take it on the face of it that he also agrees with, with Demia's theism here. He goes on to say, Philo goes on to say, that our, our human language, we, we have these uh, terms that, are, that describe God as great, uh, knowledgeable, all-powerful, and when we praise God, we use these terms, and that's fine just as long as we realize that when we use those words, they don't actually refer to reality. They don't actually refer to God's nature because God is so much greater than us and our words just fail to uh, match up to match up with God's nature. He says that at the end of the paragraph, there's, here's a statement of his empiricism. He says, our ideas reach no farther than our experience. And since God is so much, so much farther beyond our ability to understand and so much farther beyond our experience, then um, we cannot describe, we cannot understand or know God. Cleanthe says, um, <clears throat> on the contrary, I have an argument that can uh, prove God's existence and also teach us a few things about his nature. And so he said, look at the, look at the world around you, look at nature, and it has parts, it has complexity, and it seems to be uh, to have purpose and design to it. Now compare that to a machine. A machine has parts and complexity and that has purpose to it as well. The machine has a designer. And so by analogy, we can uh, infer that, we can conclude that nature, the parts of nature and, and nature as a whole also has a designer. He says, quote, since therefore the effects resemble each other, we are led to infer by the rules of analogy that the causes also resemble and that the author of nature is somewhat similar to the mind of man, though possessed of a much larger faculty, proportioned to the grandeur of the work which he has executed. And so <clears throat> we, have, we have God's existence, and we, have <clears throat> we know that God has a mind based on this argument. Now, Demia, Demia is scandalized. He thinks this is ridiculous. He thinks that Cleanthes is playing right into the hands of the atheist by using an a posteriori argument, which is induc inductive in nature, He's, he's left open a, a, a flaw or weakness that the atheist can exploit because conclusions that are based on a posteriori or inductive arguments are uh, not 100% certain. They can be disproven. There's always a possibility that, they're, that the, the conclusion is false. And so he thinks that you've got to have an a priori argument, not an a posteriori one. And Philo adds on to this saying that Cleanthes Cleanthes' analogy is not even very strong. He thinks that, uh, quote, whenever you depart in the least from the similarity of the cases, you diminish proportionably the evidence, and so the, the analogy becomes weaker. And he thinks that, that comparing things in nature to human artifacts uh, is a dissimilarity and, and then weakens the argument. He, he, he asks Cleanthes, do you really think that you can compare uh, the ha a house to the whole universe. The house has parts, so does the universe, but does, does it follow that because the house has a designer that the universe must have a designer as well? And Cleanthes responds immediately. He says, actually, that's a pretty good argument. He thinks that the house is very similar to a universe in this way and can lead to the same conclusion. And uh, Demia re replies again and says, this is ridiculous. You, for God's existence to have anything less than perfect evidence is a is scandalous and needs to that just needs to be rejected right away. Uh, Philo calms him down and says, "Let me. Well, I'm going to help you out here, but just let me make sure I understand and can present Cleanthes' arguments back to him clearly before 
before I refute it. He says, um, <clears throat> I think what you're saying, Cleanthes, is that you, when you look at things in nature like wood or stone or rocks, uh, they don't assemble themselves on their own, right? They only assemble themselves when a human mind is um, put, put to work on it, right? And so then you're saying that any type of assembly or, or um, order in nature must have as its cause a mind behind it. And so what you're saying is that's the basis for your conclusion that God exists because you see order in nature. And Cleanthes says, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. And so then Philo tries here to refute Cleanthes' argument. He says, that when you compare nature and machines, what you've got is a disproportion. One, the, these, these two things are disproportionate to one another. You can't move from one to the other or from the part to the whole. And when you're comparing, um, you, when you're comparing two parts, they've, all, they've, got to be, they've got to be similar. Otherwise, you have a, a weak analogy. So he thinks that Cleanthes is too quick here and that his comparison is disproportionate and so can't lead to the conclusion that he wants. He says, you can't infer from the existence of ships and cities to, you can't infer from that to the origin of worlds. You can't infer that one has a designer or a shipbuilder exists to the, to the idea that uh, a god exists. Clanthe says, but if you object to my reasoning, then you must also object to uh, Copernicus and his theorizing, because what he theorizes is otherworldly as well. And Philo responds and says, no, actually Copernicus's theories are much more down to earth, uh, much more this worldly and, and physical than yours. It's much easier to assent to what Copernicus says than to what you than what, what you are asserting right now. Okay, so I hope that's helpful.